Welcome to Episode 5 of Empathic Action, a YouTube channel devoted to stories of everyday heroes doing good in the world. I'm your host, Anita Novak. Today, you'll meet Salima Visram, a young woman from Kenya who studied international development and upon graduation launched a startup social enterprise powered by two things, empathy and the sun. Hi, this is Anita Novak for Empathic Action, and I'm thrilled to be here today with Salima Visram, who is the founder uh, and, I guess, executive director of a social enterprise that goes by the name of Solar, S-O-U-L-A-R, put some soul into the solar power of the sun. Why don't you tell me, Salima, what your organization's all about? Yeah, so we launched a year ago. It's basically based on a backpack with a solar panel on it that I designed in my last year of undergrad at McGill. And the panel charges a lamp. And so when kids walk to school every day in rural parts of Africa where there's no access to electricity, it gets charged with the sun. They come home every night and can study without the use, cost, and health effects of the carcinogenic kerosene lamp. Wow, that's incredible. Um, innovative product with great social impact, but there's probably a big story behind that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So you're not that old, so we can't go, you know, 40 years ago, 20 years ago, but maybe, I don't know, how many years ago back to some pivotal moments in your life that took you to today? Uh, so I grew up in Kenya beside a village where 22,000 people live below the poverty line. And from a really young age, my parents were always, I guess, made sure that I was understanding of the fact that I was really lucky that I had food to eat and water to drink and I never had to worry about my education being disrupted. And I think growing up around this area and seeing the contrast between my life and the thousands of kids' other lives out there who didn't have access to education was so grounding for me and made me realize that I had to use my education to make positive change or social impact in our world. Um, the one moment that was really, I guess, pivotal in my life was I was in boarding school for two years in Wales. And it was a night before one of my last final exams and I called my mom in tears and I just pulled an all-nighter and I wasn't prepared for my exam and it was a really overwhelming week for me because it was a month-long exam period and I called her and I was like I, I can't do my exam I need to just come home and I don't care about my school I don't care about getting my diploma and what school like I just want to leave and come home I'm too overwhelmed and I was crying and she was trying to calm, calm me down on the other side of the phone in Kenya, probably like 6,000 miles away. And then she said, um, Salima, you have no right to tell me that you're ready to give up and you want to come home and like stop, the, stop all this nonsense. Because just today I was at the school down the road from where I grew up and three girls younger than you, they were 14 years old at the time, were impregnated to child prostitution. And two of them tried to perform their own abortions and both of them passed away. Mm -hmm. And so you have no right to tell me that you, as someone who's so privileged enough and so so lucky to be able to go to school every single day, is ready to give up just because you have one final exam that's going to be hard in a few hours. Wow, that gave me goosebumps. <laughs> so what did you do with that? I think it just put me in my place a lot. And it, I was ashamed. I felt really disappointed. I felt really angry at myself for even thinking that, wow, like, I think it's all that perspective and mm. it's easy to get caught up in your own problems but when you realize that out there there's a whole world of problems and there are people living with no basic needs what what are your problems in comparison and after that I I, I mean I always was a part of different development projects and trying to initiate and implement different things in the village from water to education and healthcare. But I think that was a moment for me where I was like, okay, I want to study international development. I want to go to McGill and try and use that to make, uh, I guess, a change in the world. So you found yourself at McGill studying international development mm -hmm. and did it meet your expectations because here you wanted to change the world. When I first came to McGill and I did international development, I always had this idea of having a job with the UN after. I think that was my goal. And I came to McGill and started taking all these classes. And I think after my second year, I was like, okay, this it's just all repeating itself. It's all these theories from the Second World War. We're learning about all the dependency theory and modernization theory that really like growing up in Kenya, I didn't I it made sense, but it wasn't something that was gonna propel me to make that difference that I wanted to make. Mm. And then I took a class in social entrepreneurship and realized that wow, that you can actually find a way to generate sustainable social impact 
um, in a financially sustainable way. So the solar backpack uh, was an idea that you arrived at, but after a bit of a journey and some yeah. pivots. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that story? I was sitting at a cafe once over the two summers ago in 2014, and um, I was using a pen with a soccer ball adorned on it. And I was like, why isn't this a light? And why isn't the pen solar powered? And when a kid walks to school, it gets charged. And when they come home, the light switches on and they can just light up all the stuff they're writing mm -hmm. on. Great idea. Um, and I spoke to an engineer who said that wouldn't work. Okay, um, not a good idea. Obviously. <laughs> and so I just pivoted from one thing to another. Um, I went to solar powered shoes, a solar powered hat, a solar powered sticky panel, a mobile track, mobile library. Um, just spent a lot of time researching what worked and what didn't work for different solar companies out there and what their challenges were. And then finally came to the idea of the backpack. And so you can connect the dots between this idea that young girls who don't have access to education because their families can't afford school yeah. will end up, uh, you know, working in menial jobs, um, end up being uh, married at a young age, taking care of families, end up potentially as child prostitutes. Yeah. Um, and you can connect your backpack to an inter one point of intervention on the route to getting girls empowered. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. So I think a big problem is that education is not accessible for or to a lot of young people. And because of that, they don't get jobs. They can't go to secondary school um, and drop out, most of them, and just end up helping their parents on farms and looking for other sources of income. And I personally know people who've gone into things like child prostitution and human trafficking as a way to generate income for their families. Um, I think giving a child a tool to take control of their own education is extremely empowering for them because, yes, there are a lot of problems, and I know it's a whole system that needs to change before kids can actually alleviate themselves out of poverty. But I think giving children the tool to just study every night and take one step at a time, do their homework, and hopefully get the grades to make it into secondary school and continue their education will hopefully lead them to getting better jobs and becoming professionals and breaking away from this vicious cycle that their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents have been going through. Um, so you just alluded to something I think that's quite important and you, that most social entrepreneurs, I think, come up against, which is, you know, really innovative idea, an intervention towards a social problem. Mm -hmm. But the social problem is encased within a larger system. What are you coming up against as you're doing this work with solar? That is the hardest thing that I have to deal with because every single day you have to question whether it's enough social impact that you're creating mm -hmm. and how much is enough social impact because giving a child a backpack is not going to do anything for them in the long term. It's about creating a holistic system of interventions that will give them everything they need to kind of take them out of what they are in right now. And so that's what we're struggling with right now because we're realizing through our social impact assessment that kids don't have food to eat, they don't have money to go to secondary school, and parents need the kids' help at home and don't see the importance of doing homework. Mm -hmm. So those three things, if it's true, if a child doesn't have food to eat, they're not going to be able to mm -hmm. study. After you had come up with the idea of the solar backpack, mm -hmm. You decided that you wanted to have a prototype to test in the field um, to really get human-centered design feedback, uh, use design thinking to your advantage to ensure that the product made sense on the ground, yeah. and you launched a crowdfunding campaign. So you must have learned quite a lot through that process because you, you set out to, to raise $40,000 and you ended up raising over 50. Um, so tell us a little bit about the crowdfunding campaign. It was possibly the most challenging two months of the whole journey because I think I didn't understand that when you do a crowdfunding campaign, there are all these algorithms that you need to follow. And there's actually books written on how to crack a crowdfunding campaign. Oh. So I just jumped into it, not really knowing any of this. Right. And it was a really good experience. I think the best thing that came out of it was the fact that right now we have 501 people all around the world who are always going to be there supporting you. And they were the first people who kind of invested in the idea. And they're kind of like glo uh, Solar's global family of supporters. And how terrified were you? <laughs> so terrified. I remember sitting on my bed before I was launching the campaign and my hands were literally shaking. Mm. And I couldn't decide whether to press the button to go live or not. Mm. Um, 
And then my roommate reminded me of this quote of mine that I really liked, and it says that as women, we think of nine reasons why we should do something and one reason why we shouldn't, and we let that one reason stop us. And so in that moment, I just pressed it and not really knowing really what I was getting myself into. But I think as social entrepreneurs, you never know what you're getting yourself into. And every day, you still don't know what's coming next. So. And I know that just past weekend, um, you gave a second TED Talk uh, at McGill University and you were speaking to your peers, your millennials, yes. right? So I'm sure there'll be young millennials watching. What advice would you like to impart um, if they're thinking about you know, jumping into the the field and realm of social innovation? I think you're never going to think that it's the right time to do something. You're always going to feel like you're not good enough to do it or you don't have the skills to do it. But what I've learned is I was an international development major, didn't know nothing about finance or engineering or creating a website or legal stuff, incorporating a company. But when you do something and you have the right intentions, I think, and you're working hard at it, there will be people to help you. And when you want something so bad, the whole universe will conspire to make it happen. Mm -hmm. But you need to take that first step. Mm -hmm. And just taking that first step is exactly what you need to do because it is all our responsibilities, responsibility to do something that will benefit the world. As a last comment, um, of course, I think that you're an empathic action hero. You're an example (laughs) of empathic action. Uh, What do you think about empathy and how it uh, contributes to your work? It's the basis of the work that I do, because if you don't feel for someone else, then there's no way that you can ever do anything that will impact the world. Mm. You have to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and really understand what they're going through if you want to create any sort of impact. And that could be as a social entrepreneur, it could be just on a human to human level. It could be with your family or your friends, Um, but it is the basis of everything, love and empathy. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us next time in Beverly Hills when you'll meet one of the world's most formidable empathic action heroes of our time, a billionaire tech entrepreneur turned social impact philanthropist who believes in betting on good people doing good things. Until then, remember that anyone can become more empathic with practice, so be on the lookout for empathic action opportunities. They're everywhere.